Okay, well, hi everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you, thank you for being here. My name is Patty Julio and I use she, her pronouns. I'm talking a little bit slowly for the captioning and the interpretation. I'd like to welcome you to the Collective Ownership and Anti-Displacement Models panel. And I am very, very humbled to be the panel moderator for this afternoon. I'd like to now welcome the panelists, please, with your name, pronouns, and organization. Should I start? Uh, yeah, maybe go. I'll start. Okay. <laughs> uh, my name is uh, Inye Wakoma, uh, he, him, uh, and uh, I'm from Wanawari. Hi, I'm Kimberly Dariana. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm with Yahoo Indigenous Creatives Collective. Peace and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Curtis Calhoun. I use he, him pronouns, and uh, I am with Africa Town Preservation and Development Association. Thank you, panelists. Before we launch into our session, I would like to ask that Kim lead us in a land acknowledgement. And Carolyn, if you could please put up the slide for that. Um, awesome. So we want to acknowledge that we are on indigenous land, the traditional territories of the coastals of the Coast Salish people. Um, the text below that is that phrase in Lashutsi, and that was provided to us by the Puyallup Language Institute um, with the Puyallup tribe down near Tacoma. And then this map is really special to us. It um, was designed and graphically produced by one of our um, elder matriarchs, Denise Emerson. She's Gakomish and Dene. Um, and she made this amazing map. There's um, a history and a timeline that accompanies it. And it all the little numbers on the map um, are noting the, the over 66 coastal, na coastal Salish nations that, um, you know, traditionally occupy this, these territories. So thanks for having us here today. Thank you, Kim, really appreciate that. Uh, everyone, before we start the session, I'll just quickly go, go through our agenda for this afternoon. Uh, I have two questions that I'm going to be asking our panelists. We have uh, a PowerPoint presentation so that you can listen to their stories as well as visually connect uh, what they are saying and talking about. Uh, at the end, we will have a 15 minute Q&A time. So please hold your questions until uh, we reach the Q&A period you are welcome to uh, note your questions in the chat and I can uh, read your questions from there. And or if you feel comfortable just saying your question out loud, um, just being mindful of not speaking over each other, that would be great too. So with that, I am going to introduce our first question to the panelists. And this question is, what does collective ownership mean to you? And what is your anti-displacement model? And I believe our first panelist, uh, Kim, is going to begin. All right. um, as I said, I'm Kimberly Dariana. I'm Mandan and Hadatsa. Those are tribes with our um, treaty territories in North Dakota but I grew up in Bozeman, Montana, which is one of our, my tribe's seasonal um, rounds territories. So we would, a lot of tribes would go to that region and gather resources and meet, see our relatives and cousins every year um, and hunt buffalo. So 
it was a pretty gentrified um, place when I and is today as I've been as I was raised there. But um, traditionally, it was one of my people's people's lands. So um, I'm trying to to talk about that more and reinvigorate and empower our people to speak about that place like that. And same here um, in Seattle. So I've been in Seattle for about eight years or the occupied Duwamish Coastal Salish Territory. And my background's in architectural design and art. Um, I'm here representing Yahoo. I'm one of the board members and it's an organization I'm super passionate about um, or our collective. It, um, is something I've just once one of the first events they hosted was at the public library and um, it was it was just it was Denise actually she had curated a show there featuring um, Coast Salish Native women and it was my first opportunity to meet Asia Tail one of the main founders of the organization and that just really was the the space where I learned about this amazing org and how I got involved. Um, and so to tell you about kind of how we formed in our philosophy, um, it's appropriate to share what the meaning behind our name, Yahow. It's the creation story um, or it's drawn from a coastal Salish story told by our sacred matriarch, Vi Hilbert. Um, she's Upper Skagit. And it tells of native people from all tribes uniting around a common cause and lifting up the sky together. Um, the creator has left the sky too low. We are going to have to do something about it. And how can we do that when we do not have a common language? We can all learn one word. That is all we need. That word is yahow. That means to proceed, to go forward, to do it. So um, yahow was initiated as a year-long project series of indigenous-led satellite installations, performances, workshops, trainings, arts in residency in residences, art markets, publications, and partner events. Um, across more than 25 sites in the um, Seattle, Tacoma, the Coastal Salish region. And it was founded by Asia Tail. She's Cherokee, Tracy Rector. She's um, Choctaw, Seminole and Black. And Sapri Kalan, she's um, Pakistani. And these all these events culminated in the inaugural exhibition of Seattle's King Street Station from March to August of 2019. Um, so one of the unique things about this ex exhibition is we were trying to decolonize the the way you do an exhibition in our call, and we wanted to indigenize it and allow all the all our um, our relatives who were interested in participating to be accepted to the show. So that that meant that we had over 200 indigenous creatives contributing to our show. And um, so now that we're, that has gone and passed, um, we had a really good response from our community, like myself included, we all, built this really strong bond and just had this space where we all felt nurtured and safe to really um, walk in our true indigenous values. And so um, since then we've been ideating and really taking time to have a strategic plan about what what's the next, you know, 2.0 of Yahoo for our collective. and. Um, we're basically taking off from what our founders created and um, moving into this interdisciplinary 
cultural art and design services group. Um, we have an expanded team of project managers and hundreds of artists working in a variety of mediums um, in the coastal Salish territories and beyond. And we really work to center indigenous voices, two-spirit young people. Um, our practices are accompanied by relationship building, mentorship opportunities, and to support um, creative development in communities and with the intent that all participants will gain experience, exposure, and build sustaining connections. So um, we're rooted in indigenous values and which means like we, we look out for each other and we are um, protective and we advocate for each other. So making sure we have radically equitable paid opportunities to make an exhibit work, um, official and unofficial mentorships for creation, project management and artist artistry, um, residencies, space for making and community making workshops, um, just, just dismantling barriers, like that's our first step to um, anti-gentrification and um, collective ownership. That's what we were founded on and that's our guiding principles moving forward. Um, this is an example of one of our consulting projects that we got to work on and how we can work at different scales. Um, we, since we are a collective and we're, you know, we're creating partnerships with other native orgs, if any of you were at the Sun Talk just now, um, that's, you know, we're all in relation and always talking to each other so that we're, um, we're figuring out ways to weave together opportunities and provide economic, um, economic opportunities for our people. Um, so with this all, all building that Chief Seattle is building 80 units of transitional housing for homeless native people, um, we, um, we, we got to like help um, help imagine and um, refine this matriarch welcome figure that will be in brick on the side of the building. And then there's over 20 other pieces of artwork throughout the building and on the building, some of its integrated art that um, Yahao and our collective um, will help contribute and um, get to dress the building with. So um, that's sort of one of our, one of our um, phase two consulting projects that we were so excited to be a part of. Uh, next slide. Oh shoot, my text is all wonky. Um, so looking forward, um, we've in this, this year of COVID, it's been a little bit difficult. Our momentum has, you know, everybody I'm sure has kind of paused a little bit and um, had to step, step back from maybe the, the community rigor that we were all excited about from the show. Um, and so we figured out ways to, you know, try to keep our community going and address the needs of um, what is happening in our world right now. And so we've had opportunities like with yard signs to help um, keep our message alive and help people um, have, you know, have this positive, these positive messages and of hopefulness and art um, invigorate public space. And then also we were really honored to have some of our black indigenous um, folks participate in some sign, some um, poster signs that um, reflect our, so our solidarity and support of all of the um, just um, awfulness that 
what's happening with Black Lives Matter last over the past year. So um, those were some project, little projects that we did in light of the pandemic. We also issued some COVID relief money because so much of our community has, um, you know, so much of our community's work has halted as a result of COVID. So getting some funds out to people was really important to us. And um, we've also been um, working on just becoming, having our own nonprofit status and um, doing more grant and fundraising so that we can um, move into our, our big vision goal, which is to acquire a parcel of land um, in Seattle, and then hopefully eventually also acquire a larger parcel, parcel of land um, outside of the city um, so that we can have that community ownership model and um, really transition out of, well, not transition fully, but move into our own space so we can continue this um, work of just healing and understanding what our people need to feel like we belong and um, reinvigorate the sense of belonging that was felt in these shows, but could have even been um, more rich if we were in control of the space that we were occupying. So um, I'm gonna, if you wanna go to the next slide, yeah, this is this is like our initiative. We haven't really formally announced it yet or anything. It's just on the brink of um, us figuring out how to share it with people. So it's really exciting to be here to be able to share it with you all. But it's our land back initiative um, for regenerative placekeeping. And one of our the ideas that we're circling around is like the start is to have this outdoor space where we can um, where artists can, you know, test and prototype ideas that they've had and um, maybe eventually we'll have some sort of outdoor sculpture park in the south end of the city, an indigenous um, sculpt outdoor sculpture park for everybody to enjoy. So I'll let, is it Inye next? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Kimberly. That was so amazing. I'm so excited as we probably all are about the Land Back initiative. Uh, thank you very much for sharing. I'd like to invite our second panelist to share what coll collective ownership means uh, to them and, and their anti-displacement model. So Inye, please. You're on mute. There you go. All right. Um, sorry about that. Yeah, so I'm here to talk a little bit about our project, Wanawari. Um, so Wanawari is a, a center for Black art, um, community stories, and social connection in the Central District. Um, it's sited in uh, a home that's been in my family for uh, five generations um, since, uh, the, uh, since the early 1950s and has been um, occupied by family um, for almost the entirety of the time that it's been in our family. Um, and, uh, so yeah, so next slide, move to the next slide. Yep. Um, so yeah, so Wanawari, our, this is our mission. Uh, Wanawari creates space for black ownership, possibility and belonging through art, historic preservation and connection. And so this mission, um, emerged out of um, the the reason why uh, we started the project, which was to prevent the impending sale of this house and another house um, in the family that both of which were owned by my grandmother, um, and so we wanted to to keep her in her home uh, for her remaining years, uh, and uh, and so our our goal as a family was to figure out how to do it, and um, and then you know my contribution to that family effort. Um, was to partner with uh, three of my friends and colleagues 
um, to uh, start Wanawari as a community space, which allowed us to um, rent the home um, at a rate that would allow my grandmother to keep the home. Um, and so it was really important, you know, for us as artists to figure out, you know, how art could be um, uh, a frontline strategy to, to prevent um, the ongoing displacement of the Black community in the CD. Um, next slide, please. So yeah, so, um, and we can just run through um, these next three or four slides are just bullet points just to illustrate some of the things that we do. So yeah, so we do visual art at Wanawari, which includes exhibitions, um, uh, rotating exhibitions of four to five artists um, per exhibition cycle, um, along with artist talks, workshops, um, and other forms of presentations, historic preservation, um, which really uh, anchor, is anchored in um, the collection and presentation of community stories, i.e. oral histories, but not exclusively oral histories. Um, sometimes uh, community stories um, happen uh, in, in other forms. Um, in this slide here, uh, there are two examples in the upper right hand. Um, there's a story quilt um, that was uh, coordinated by uh, poet Stormy Weber, uh, but she worked with a host of uh, uh, quilters um, to create um, a visual narrative of the Central District. Um, and in the lower left-hand corner, um, there's a presentation by the African-American Writers Alliance, um, where um, as, a, as a body of writers, they, they created um, a body of uh, poetry, that, that poems that uh, told their personal stories and recollections of living in the Central District. So, um, you know, the way that we, we do historic preservation uh, through oral histories, um, you know, really, you know, is about, you know, is really anchored in how people in the community, you know, um, embody uh, stories and storytelling. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, belonging. So um, I would say, aside from our regular um, exhibition work, um, probably 80 to 90 percent of everything that happens at Wanawari um, is generated by the community. Um, we provide the space and um, and just sort of let people know, hey, if there's anything you want to do, um, you know, we're here to to facilitate it. And so um, here in this slide, you know, that has included um, just sort of uh, backyard parties. Um, we have a garden project, uh, Bloom, which is a partnership um, with Seattle Public. Uh, library and um, nurturing roots. I believe uh, there are a few few community partners um, uh, in the upper uh, right hand corner. Um, was a fashion show that was um, that was put on by a collective of, of artists um, ranging from Seattle to Tacoma. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, and so all of this is anchored in. Um, our vision for using arts as a frontline strategy to, to um, combat displacement. Specifically, we're interested in, you know, how our work can help anchor um, existing Black homeowners in the neighborhood by, you know, um, helping them strategize around uh, ways that they can creatively use um, their properties um, to adapt to, you know, the changing cost of, you know, owning a home in Seattle. Um, so our organizing project, uh, Case 21, um, you know, really takes on the policy dimensions um, that uh, impact Black homeowners' ability to keep their homes and transfer those homes uh, to their um, descendants um, in the form of generational wealth. Um, and so this work is, is, is focused on bringing together Black homeowners and cultural workers um, to address um, a host of policy issues from, um, from zoning to uh, taxation to permitting um and you know all the things associated with you know with um land use um in residential neighborhoods in the hopes that um we can change some of those policies and make it easier for folks to to implement community um driven uh, strategies um for for uh, both cultural anchoring but also community anchoring next slide please So yeah, so you know, we started as a just as a response to an immediate need for our family um, to to prevent the sale of these homes. Um, but of course, you know, our you know our goal, you know, as a family was to keep these these homes in the family. Um, and so you know, we started to think about um, well, how can you know the the 
the success of Wanawari as a project um, be transformed into something that is enduring, right? And so, you know, about a year or so in, we, we started to imagine um, the possibility of uh, us being able to purchase the property with my grandmother, um, you know, in, in the waning years of her life, you know, we were beginning to think about um, what would happen when she passed and, you know, and could we, you know, figure out a way to, to purchase these homes and keep Wanawari as a community institution. And so we launched a capital campaign um, to not only purchase the home that Wanawari is in, um, but to purchase um, uh, hopefully two other homes in the family um, and transform those spaces into uh, community and cultural space use as well. Um, and so that project has been going on for about a year and a half now, um, and we're making pretty good headway. So um, I think maybe in the next uh, few weeks or, or month or so, we might have some really exciting news um, to announce, but you know, um, we're still kind of putting our pieces together for that. Next slide, please. So yeah, so, you know, um, really kind of um, looping back and, and looking at where the story of, uh, and the vision of Wanawari intersects with the story and the vision um, of my family, right? And so I'm, I'm really standing personally, you know, at the nexus point of, of, you know, these two sort of entities, right? My family, you know, my whole family relationships and then all of the relationships and all the work that we're doing at Wanawari. Um, and really thinking about, you know, um, what does that look like in real terms? Um, and so uh, in thinking about, well, what, you know, what does ownership look like? You know, if Wanawari is going to purchase these properties, is Wanawari, you know, really just going to be modeling, you know, um, how, you know, an organization can buy out, you know, properties from a, a Black family, you know, and, you know, and thereby sort of, you know, having, you know, just another version of displacement. Right, you have a family that you know ultimately did lose their properties, um, and so um, as uh, family members, you know, we got together and, and did some deep thinking about it, um, and decided uh, to come together and form a nonprofit um, and name it after our grandparents, um, the ones who own these properties, the Frank and Goldeen Green Cultural Land Conservancy, um, and then you know enter into a partnership with Wanawari where. Um, the FGC, um, FGG CLC would actually um, be the one to purchase the property um, as a part of the capital campaign, um, be the long-term owners, and Juan Warrior would be the long-term tenant. Um, and in that way, the family would still retain ownership, the community would still have um, their community spaces, and we would also be modeling ways that other Black families could um, creatively problem solve around the barriers of of ownership using the traditional model, which is, you know, one person, you know, one property, right? And so, you know, we're really looking at, you know, what, what does collective ownership look like for Black families? How can we reimagine um, coming together, um, you know, to solve, you know, some of the economic barriers that, you know, uh, we've been facing for generations? Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so um, uh, this is the four founders of the Frank and Golden Green Cultural Land Conservancy. It's myself, uh, my sister, Ibiade Sek, uh, my brother, Tony Wakoma, and uh, my other brother, Yidam Sek. Um, I'm an artist uh, and uh, now an arts administrator. Um, uh, my brother, Tony, is a, is a financial manager. My sister, Ibiade, is, a, is an attorney, and my brother is... Uh, both an artist and um, and a, and a, a, a sort of a, a construction worker, right? He does um, home renovation projects and and um, energy energy efficient um, uh, sort of upgrades on homes. And so, you know, we've used our combined skill set and our combined you know expertise um, to you know to really come together and problem solve um, around this. And so, these are the kind of things that we really want to model for other Black families. You know that you know our wealth is not only in Know how we raise money, but you know how do we use our talents to, you know, to um, make something happen for ourselves? Next slide, please. Um, so yeah, so these are the three homes. Uh, this the uh, the house that Wanawari is in. Um, the house in the bottom center is the house um, that my grandmother was living in when she was alive. Um, it's a house over in uh, in the Mount Baker neighborhood. Um, 
And then the house in the upper right hand corner is the house that I live in. It's the first house that my grandfather purchased when he came to Seattle in 1947. Um, and so all three of these homes are homes that we are looking to um, to move into ownership under the Frank and Golding Green Cultural Land Conservancy um, and then transform them into uh, community and, cu and cultural spaces. Um, next slide. Let's go back a couple. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Forward one. Sorry, my computer had a and then it <laughs> really <laughs> fast forwarded. <laughs> yeah, no time. Um, so yeah, so you know, all of this is really anchored in, you know, um a long history of um our family working together. Um, you know, I just assembled um some photos that I could find of uh myself and my siblings. Um you know, we're either working on the pro on the properties or working um, in family businesses that were also here in the CD. Um, you know, one looks like it's out in the country, but my grandfather actually had a, a, a firewood business on 23rd and Cherry um, for a couple of decades um, where Coyote Central is right now. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, we all worked there at that, you know, um, bringing in logs from, you know, from the Olympic Peninsula, you know, um, sawing them up, chopping them into into mm -hmm. cords and, and delivering into places, you know, uh, in the greater metropolitan area. Um, and so that was one of the things that really sort of solidified, you know, um, sort of this value system of working together, right? There was always a sense of collective responsibility uh, and care, you know, for everything, you know, um, that surrounded us as a family. All three of those houses um, that, you know, I showed in this uh, presentation, um, were almost always occupied by family. Um, my grandparents owned them. They they always rented them uh, well below uh, market rate rent. Um, and my grandparents, you know, values around that was that um, we have these homes not to you know um, to get rich, but to make sure that family always has a place to stay and uh, a part of um, uh, maintaining that those values and that vision was that everybody had to contribute, you know, um, to to the care of of these things and so you know wanna wire really taps in you know to that value system of um collective responsibility um collective ownership collective care um cre collective creativity you know cre collective visioning for the future um you know and you know one of the stories that you know um that sometimes i i tell is uh when my grandfather passed you know my grandma was mother was already well into um advanced stages of alzheimer's um and so uh, when my grandfather passed he, you know there are two things that he did one um he refused to uh, draft a will and he compelled his children to either figure out how to um collectively uh steward you know the family properties together or lose everything um and he also you know with his last breath you know admonished us to to take care of his wife our grandmother right and i think you know, in, in between those things, what he was really saying is that um, all of this is designed, you know, to really, um, to, to bolster the value system of collective, you know, care and responsibility. And, and if, um, if we're not prioritizing that, then we don't deserve to have anything, right? And I think um, those are the values that we've taken to heart at Wanawari and, and really thinking about, you know, how does collective care, collective responsibility, collective creativity, um, how does that center in how we think about ownership, how we think about what we're doing, how do we think about our future um, and how do we move forward with those values really defining defining us. So, um, so yeah, that, that's, that's where we are. Thank you, Inye. Oh, it's so inspiring to see these photos. Uh, just hearing about your family story and land and legacy and transforming that into collective ownership is really powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. We'll go to our last panelist, Curtis. Yes, thank you. Peace and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Curtis Calhoun. Uh, again, I'm a project manager with Africa Town Preservation and Development Association as well as a community manager at Black Dot, which is our business arm or hub. Uh, and to answer the question, the first question, I kind of go into a little bit of the history of Africatown. Uh, Africatown First is an asset-based community development initiative 
So that asset base piece is important because we seek to acquire assets uh, in the name of the community for community ownership. Uh, it started out with uh, uh, two crack houses on 24th and Spring that were converted into community spaces, uh, mainly at that time for youth to be able to come. There was a studio there, so they were able to do music. It was a place for them to come and, and, and be out of the streets and, and have a place where they could kind of find support for the things that were important to them in their lives. So uh, that space was created from there. Uh, the Emoja Peace Center 501c3 was created and became a nonprofit. And out of that birthed uh, kind of Africa Town, the initiative that we're talking about. So Africa Town, there was a, 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 I think something the mayor did a little while back, it was Seattle 2035. And in that, when Y King attended, he really didn't see Africans, African Americans, Africans of the diaspora included in that, that plan. So created something called uh, Black Seattle 2035, which now has kind of uh, um, emerged as uh, the state of Africa town, something we do the first part of every year, generally to try to do it as close to uh, the weekend before Martin Luther King Day as possible. But we identified certain areas uh, in the community that we wanted to have an impact or, or results in uh, to be able to preserve the community for those of the African diaspora and African Americans. We wanted to be able to create something similar to Chinatown, where not all Asian Americans live in Chinatown, but they come back there to experience uh, the things that they remember from their past, for their culture, for their history, for the traditions. So we wanted to be able to create a space like that in uh, the Central District, which was at one point very much uh, uh, black, you know, look black, uh, large black population. Uh, that has obviously waned and it is, is very low now, but we wanted to be able to preserve space for those who were there to be able to stay there by creating affordable housing and, and opportunities. Uh, we wanted to be able to provide space for those who maybe have moved other places through gentrification and predatory developing to be able to come back and live there if they choose to. But we also wanted to, again, like we said, create that space for those who maybe were happy where they went, but still wanted to come back to the neighborhood to experience those things that they remember from their childhood or growing up or the things that they uh, did when they used to live there or, you know, came through there. Uh, so with that, we uh, have the Emoja Peace Center. We do the Emoja Festival every year, first weekend of August, three-day festival. Um, and what we're doing with that is creating uh, kind of placemaking where we have a place and we have a, a destination space where people will travel to to be able to come enjoy the festival. It's like a family reunion every year. You get to come see people you haven't seen for a long time, people you went to school with, grew up with, people you know that moved away, maybe came back. And, and because that big festival provides an opportunity, you're able to run into them there. Uh, we have Africa Town uh, Community Land Trust, which is the property developer. And Africa Town Community Land Trust, we are first project that we worked on, a community-based project with Capitol Hill House, and at the time, now Community Roots Housing, uh, Black Community Impact Alliance, or Village Spirit Center, and then Bird Bar Place, as well as Africa Town. It's a affordable, uh, uh, 120 units of affordable housing. Uh, there are four commercial spaces on the bottom. Um, we were able to, with that project, uh, with Wimby Participation, Women and Minority Business Enterprise, uh, increase that. Um, generally, it's about 17% on the project. Our goal was 50%, but we were able to get 33%. So we were able to double what uh, the population of uh, BIPOC subcontractors and, and contractors on that project. We were able to uh, do something called affirmative uh, leasing, where we were able to put out to the African American, African diaspora community first, uh, the opportunities uh, to understand and know uh, how to apply and then be able to help and give them assistance to be able to get through the process. So we were able to get uh, more Africans and African-Americans into the project as residents. And then we we're also able in the four commercial spaces, able to get in uh, three uh, African-American owned businesses. We have Earl's Cuts and Styles, we have uh, the Communion, and we also have a Cafe of Vol, which is the last um, business that's gonna be in there real soon. They're doing their tenant improvements as we speak. We all know Earl's has been around the community, not only as a barber, but as a place where folks can go and, and be able to uh, hear other men, you know, it, it goes on in a barbershop just to support uh, that takes place there. And he's been around for a long time providing that. And then Christy, just the amazing restaurant that she created, the awesome food, 
uh, world uh, renowned, uh, winning awards. Uh, you know, it's for one of the best restaurants in the world. So we were happy that that those three businesses worked out. And then Cafe of Bowl, Cafe of Bowl uh, is a, a young startup that started out in the Rainier Valley. Uh, they now have a coffee roaster, and they're going to be bringing their original, traditional Ethiopian uh, coffee and coffee ceremony into that area. So just three uh, businesses that we're very proud of, and we're happy uh, that we're able to fill those spaces. Uh, but we're, we're really excited about the project because it gives us a model for future projects. We have the Africa Town Plaza, uh, which will be uh, going up, uh, hopefully breaking ground sometime at the, before the end of this year. Uh, they're on 24th between, or they're on spring between 24th and 23rd. It's going to be a very similar project with affordable housing at the top, commercial space in the bottom, and then there may be some sort of uh, office or administrative space uh, maybe on the second floor. But we're looking to do the same thing, increasing Wimby participation, uh, you know, the women and minority uh, black owned business participation, also um, being able to put more and, and creating some sort of a shared co-working space for uh, uh, small businesses and entrepreneurs so that they can share the price of the, the lease instead of uh, having to come up with the money all on their own. So it would be a space where we'd have multiple uh, businesses in that one space. Um, from there, we also have Africatown Preservation and Development Association. So the uh, land trust goes out and acquires the land and then the APDA determines what's the best use of that land for the community. We do that through a lot of community engagement. Uh, we had something before COVID happened, we had done two years in a row with something we did annually in July. It was called Design Weekend, uh, where we brought the community in and based on projects that we had, our properties that we had, had identified in the area, but asked them to uh, put their minds together to be able to create uh, projects that could go in those spaces. Uh, and get their impact and feed, uh, feedback or get their input and feedback. Um, so with this, you see Africatown Plaza in the picture there. Uh, and that was at an event where Y King and uh, the group uh, were able to, uh, the mayor was giving away uh, grants uh, and awarding the grants uh, to projects that had been chosen in Africatown Plaza was one of those. So that gave us the funding to be able to start the project and, and uh, do the work. Uh, but the Preservation Development Association is the place making or placeholder uh, organization. So we identify properties or projects that are underserved or under resourced and find ways to be able to create space in those uh, projects or, or, or that property to be able to hold space until we identify what's the best use of that space and then how to come up with funding to be able to implement uh, those projects or programs. Uh, there's also Africatown Center for Education and Innovation. Uh, this is a, a building down on um, Alaska and Martin Luther King. Uh, and that is where intergenerational learning takes place. Uh, we do our best to have after school programs, summer programs, spring break programs. And then we also try to not only uh, have it for youth, but it's also opportunities for elders to be able to come share their knowledge. Uh, maybe they uh, don't know how to teach uh, what they know, but they do have value and what they've learned in their life experience that they can come and share that wisdom uh, with the youth and, and provide opportunities for that. And then as far as uh, the economic part, the economic piece, the uh, APDA has a black dot, which is the business arm or hub. And we wanted to be able to create a space uh, where black entrepreneurs and small business owners could come and increase their business acumen through educational opportunities, through access to affordable commercial space, through access to grants and affordable loans, uh, and then just space where they could do business and contract. So you have uh, where they can come in and do meetings, they can come in and use the space to get work. Maybe they don't wanna go to uh, Starbucks or maybe they just wanna get out of the house and have a different environment. And then just the opportunity to network. When you come through, you never know who's gonna be there, whether it's uh, King County Councilman, uh, Gurmai Zahalai, Zahalai or whether it's a Kashama Sawant, or whether it's a Lorena Gonzalez, or whoever it may be, uh, there's uh, always somebody you can run into that you weren't expecting that uh, was a pleasure. So uh, also with that, we provide opportunities for folks to rent that space out, to be able to use the space to hold events uh, as well. And uh, just a plug here, uh, we have our grand reopening this uh, tomorrow night, actually, from 6 to 9 p.m. So if you're in the area, Central District, Central and Jackson, during that time, please come through. Have a great catered event by um, 
uh, Jones's Barbecue and, and Taste of the Caribbean. Mm-hmm. I have a live DJ and it's going to have a lot of prize giveaways with uh, Black Dot merchandise. So, uh, But that, our whole idea was to be able to identify uh, places in our community, the Central District, which is the epicenter of Africatown, and be able to see what was being underutilized or under-resourced and be able to come up with uh, ideas from the community, led by the community, driven by the community, to what would best serve the community and improve the quality of life in those, of those in the community. So we definitely uh, want to continue to do that. We definitely want to be a community-led and driven uh, organization, and we're doing the best we can to make sure that we maintain uh, those good relations and uh, provide those opportunities. Thank you, Curtis. It's just so amazing to watch all of these Africa town projects rise from the ground. Um, it is just it is just incredible to walk or drive down the street and then just see these beautiful, beautiful buildings risen. Uh, so thank you for sharing. Uh, everyone, we are running just a little bit behind. <laughs> So I am going to open it up now for uh, some questions and answers. Um, I saw that there are a couple of folks that had questions in the chat, but uh, I'd like to open it up. Does anyone want to ask a question of the panelists right now while I look through the chat? And I'll just jump in. This is Caroline. If you would like to unmute and join video, if you just pressed uh, request video and audio, um, you can join the panelists. Uh, in the chat, Elizabeth Ma- Maupin, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, Elizabeth asked the question regarding affirmative leasing. How do you implement that? Hi, Elizabeth. It was just uh, what we uh, put out and released in the media through press release and just through our networks, uh, an opportunity for the community to get the information first. Uh, You know, with affordable housing, it has to be equal for everybody. So there's no way we could select anybody. But we wanted to make sure that our people had the opportunity or the community had the opportunity to know that uh, what was going on, but then also how to take advantage of it so, to be able to get their paperwork in order, to be able to uh, identify the things that they were going to need when they came in and applied, so that it would streamline the process of them being accepted or, uh, you know, given the lease. Thank you. Is there another question? Jill, uh, yes, I do have a. Uh, yes, I do have a question. Hi, so um, uh, with all these community projects, especially focusing on serving um, Black, Indigenous, and traditionally um, marginalized communities that specifically uh, also um, suffer from the uh, negative effect of criminal, of, uh, uh, sorry, um, like environmental uh, justice, is there a priority on having those spaces, having like uh, green spaces? parks and the recreational spaces. Um, I'll start. Yeah, for like for our land back initiative, we're, um, that's one of our, our goals is to like, to start with the land and not, um, you know, jump to development or not prioritize, like what's the, what's the maximum development opportunities for this land parcel? Like we just wanna have a place where we're touching the earth and that we're regenerated, being regenerative to um, an urban space in the city because, you know, right now property is so sparse and, um, it just feels like all the empty lots are going to be eaten up by, um, by dense housing, which is a need. And I'm not, I love it, but, um, I think we also need to collectively be thinking about how we want to shape our city so that it isn't just homogenous. Thank you. 
if you can. Yeah, I'll just I'll just chime in. Um, uh, so I mentioned that we have um, a partnership um, with Seattle Public Libraries and Nurturing Roots, the Project Bloom, and you know that that you know is uh, a project that brings in uh, community members, you know, to imagine how to use the yard as a productive uh, uh, food justice site. Um, some of the things that have emerged, you know, um, while that work has been going on is um, some uh, sample testing of the soil specifically around a, a garage that um, had some old leaded paint. Um, and so now Bloom is really imagining, you know, uh, what are the opportunities around um, uh, doing soil remediation on the site. Um, so that's an ongoing process. I don't know. Um, we actually have some blue members in the audience. So if you guys want to jump in and, and, you know, and, and talk about the work that you're doing, that would be exciting for folks to hear, uh, from you, um, you know, as, you know, a member of Wanawari, you know, uh, we facilitate the project in, in, as the site coordinating context, um, we're not always on the front lines of the de decision-making. So, um, but, you know, that is one of the things that, you know, we know that is a, a problem in 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 cities is that you know oftentimes um, the land is you know is polluted from all the various uses um, that have taken place over the you know over the years and so um, you know when we talk about food justice you know um, and we talk about growing food um, you know you know you actually do run up against um, having clean soil and clean land you know to do that in safely so um, I think when you start to when you start to really, you know, peel back the layers of, you know, um, uh, doing one thing and that leads to doing another, um, you see how all of these issues are are interconnected. Thank you, Inye. Mm -hmm. We've got three minutes left. And so I'm gonna ask the last question. <laughs> so panelists, three minutes. Uh, what does healing and cultural preservation look like in your community? Um, so I'll just I'll say super really quickly, but I, I feel like everybody has spoken to this in one way or another. Um, is uh, for Wanawari, um, for Black folks that actually have a place to come back where they feel whole, you know, and fully embodied in the neighborhood, um, and the fact that we are in a home. Um, which, you know, automatically, you know, connects people to the most intimate and, and comforting experiences, you know, hopefully, you know, home, you know, not always for everybody, but, you know, hopefully for, for folks, you know, um, you know, that brings back a sense of comfort and safety. And, and um, that's the kind of energy that, that um, we want to embody for folks, you know, particularly for folks who have a deep emotional connection to the CD, um, and, but don't come back because every time they come back, it's traumatizing, right? Um, and, you know, to have a place that they can come back to um, where um, they feel whole again, um, you know, and, you know, we're doing art and we're doing things that are creative and energizing. Um, that's a part of, um, of how we, you know, we, we address that issue. Kim? Okay. You can go if you want, Curtis, but I can go. Um, so, Mine's a little like ethereal and philosophical, but um, I think it's like for me in an urban context, I'm in this space and I think our my, my organizational um, colleagues are in the same space, like creating and building our connections um, to our indigenous knowledge and our kinship systems is like our goal. And that can kind of be summarized in this idea of seven generations, which um, also like Curtis and um, Inye talk about in their, or they, they're like exercising this approach in a lot of ways too. Um, seven generations is thinking about the, Pre, the, the three generations previous to us and not losing sight of that knowledge and that um, what our, our ancestors did for us to bring us to our present state. And then also 
um, making sure we're protecting and nurturing the needs for the three future generations, at least <laughs> those three. So um, yeah, we're just, that's like one of the philosophies we keep in mind in our work and our organization, but how that we're still prototyping and figuring out what that looks like in a, in a realistic and like a concrete form. Thank you, Kim and Curtis, would you like to close us out with yep. what Just does healing quick. and cultural preservation look like? Yeah, just real quick, because I know we're short on time. I was doing some research on trauma recently, and I came across someone who has experienced trauma cannot truly heal until the sense of power or power uh, that was taken away by the trauma has been restored. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's a powerful piece, because with the social injustices, the predatory developing, the gentrification that goes on, our power is being taken daily. And until uh, those who are taking the power or allies along with us seek to restore that power, it's hard for healing to take place. So that should be the focus is being able to, and that's what we're talking about today, ownership and, and being able to acquire these assets. So we have determination and autonomy over what happens and what's the best use of them for our community to bring that healing about. Thank you, Curtis. That was really powerful. And thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. We really appreciate it and really hope that you found it inspiring. Uh, so we will let you go on to the next session and um, please stay safe and take care. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.